communication or it's very hard to communicate. And this is a classical model of communication complexity. It's been around since the 80s. And what's great about this model is there is a lot of deep results in this model. They're super hard, but um, they're useful because we can use them sort of black box in all the other models. So I really want to talk about this model. This is the model where there's somebody named Alice and somebody named Bob, and they each have an input. They want to compute some, they want to talk and compute some function. Okay. It's the function that's on both of their inputs. And the question is, how much do the communication do they have to have so that they both know the answer to f of x, y? Okay. So um, this depends on the function f, but your goal is to minimize the number of exchanged bits and sort of magical things can sometimes happen in this, um, in this model. For example, for some functions such as equality, trying to test whether um, x is equal to y, this function seems like something where Alice should have to send her whole string or Bob should send his whole string to Alice or maybe Alice sends the first half and Bob sends the second half, but somehow it seems like everybody should somehow all the bits need to get sent in order for these guys to know that they're equal, but that's not true. It turns out with constant bits of communication, Alice and Bob can know if they have the same string as long as they're willing to accept some probability of error. So this is like a magical result. On the other hand, disjointness. Maybe Alice's string represents all the items she wants to buy in the grocery store. Uh, so she has zeros for items she doesn't want, and she has a one in location i if she wants to buy the ith item. And Bob is the same with his string y. And now we want to see, is it the case that Alice and Bob want to buy any of the same items? Or is it the case that all of the items Alice wants are totally separate from the items that Bob wants? Okay, so this is called the disjointness problem. That requires omega n bits of communication, where they're where n is the number of items. Okay, so that is a much different problem than equality. Uh, and the issue is these lower bounds are super hard. It, decades, they took decades to come by, um, but, and they, they use a lot of deep mathematics, but they're super useful for lower bounds in all of the other models that I'll talk about. Actually, every single one of the rest of the models I talk about, one of the best ways of getting lower bounds in them come from communication complexity. Okay, so let's move to another model. Here, you uh, can have communication, but there's no space, okay? What do I mean by no space? This is the data stream model. A data stream is a massive sequence of data. It's too large to store on disk um, or memory or in your cache or wherever. And it's just sort of flying by and you have a little bit of local memory where you can remember some things that you saw, but certainly not everything that flew by. Okay, so this is a model that's um, used to represent network traffic where there's lots and lots of packets running by. You cannot store all the network traffic that went by your uh, node, but um, maybe you can keep certain statistics about it. Database transactions, sensor networks, satellite data feed, and on and on. Okay, so usually the model looks like this. Um, there's some data streaming by and usually you get a single or maybe a constant number of passes. And your goal is to minimize the local memory usage that you need. Okay, so for example, there's a stream of numbers going by and um, you know, there's some, it's flying by like a stream and you wanna figure out how many distinct elements are there. Okay, so um, now, if you could keep infinite memory, then you might have noticed that you saw eight distinct elements. Okay, but what's amazing about a streaming algorithm is even if you only had like three bits of memory or certainly not enough to store all eight names of elements that you saw, you can still keep a good estimate of how many distinct elements you saw. Okay, seeing roughly eight. You can not answer, you won't know exactly how many distinct elements you saw, but you'll have a good approximation. Okay, so this is quite magic. And in fact, there's low space algorithms known for many problems, distinct elements, heavy hitters, large wavelet coefficients, clustering, all kinds of graph problems. Um, and one technique that's quite useful in this area is something called linear sketching, where you view the stream as performing updates to a high dimensional vector X, uh, such as X might tell you if something's um, might just be all the possible elements and telling you if you added an element or deleted an element. And then you compute a sketch, which is really, what's the sketch? You pick a random matrix A 
and you apply it to this vector x, uh, and the result is a much smaller dimensional vector, which hopefully contains the information that you need. And so hopefully you can recover the property, perhaps the LP norm or some other important property of the original X that you're updating from this sketch or this li linear transformation into a much smaller number of dimensions. Uh, and hopefully it still keeps the information. There's a way of getting the information back from AX. Okay, so this motivates one more model called sketching algorithms, where you have the data, you take various sketches of it, sometimes it's multiplying by a random matrix, sometimes it's something else, you retain the essential information, and because it's smaller, it's easier to compute on it, it's easier to communicate because it's smaller, and it's easier to store. Okay, so the sketches are important in streaming, distributed, and dynamic settings. So these are all ways of thinking about big data. Okay, so I talked about communication, I talked about space and storage, and now I want to talk about time. Okay, so th in this case, you don't even get to see all the data. Okay, so before you got to see it, but you didn't, you know, it was streaming by, you didn't get to remember much. Now you don't even get to see it. Okay, what are you going to do? Well, definitely, you're going to have to compromise and come up with some sort of approximation um, to what you mean by the right answer. And we're going to think about two models. One is called the property testing model, and the other is the traditional approximation model. Okay, let me start with the second one because it's more familiar. Um, here, there's some, the data is some kind of graph or a linear program or a large string or a large function description. And what you want to output is some number that's close to the value of the optimal solution, but you don't have enough time to construct a solution. Okay, so for example, minimum spanning tree, um, you get to look at locations that you carefully choose. They might be sampled randomly or that you may pick a random starting point and do a breadth first search, or you might do a, pick a random standing point starting point and do um, a random walk. Uh, these are all techniques that have been used. So you may want to estimate the minimum spanning tree, estimate a vertex cover, estimate a max cut, uh, estimate the solution to a positive linear program. Given two large strings, you may want to estimate their edit distance. These are all things you might want to do in sublinear time and can be done. Okay, I mean, in sublinear time. Uh, all right, another type of a compromise you may make is instead of trying to estimate a value, um, I may want to distinguish inputs that have a specific property from those that are far from having that property. So I like to think of these as in the ballpark park versus out of the ballpark kind of tests. You know, in the ballpark means it has the property, out of the ballpark it's far from having the property. If you're on the edge of the ballpark, kind of swinging off the uh, the lights, then the you know it's you can answer it either way, okay? So I'm gonna give the algorithm leeway. If you're close to having the property, you're allowed to say, yes, it has the property. If, But you're also allowed to say it doesn't have the property. Either answer is okay. Okay, so those in-between inputs that are close, you get to answer either yes, it has the property or no, it doesn't. That leeway allows you to answer questions much faster and in sublinear time. So we can use kind of ideas of sampling plus algorithms to get much faster, much faster types of results. And often this is the natural question to ask. For example, when noise is present and you're asking, are these points K clusterable? Um, you expect some kind of outlier. So you don't really, you know, you don't really expect that all the points are K clusterable. It's okay if a few of the points are not gonna fit in one of your K clusters. Uh, so it's okay to answer, yes, it's K clusterable, um, but it might be good to know that the noise exists. Okay, when the data is constantly changing, this might be the reasonable thing to ask. Um, and it gives a fast sanity check to rule out very bad inputs. It's also related to the model selection problem in machine learning. Okay, so there's a lot of results known here uh, for graphs. Um, and a lot. I'm gonna mention these because some of these are by the um, people involved in this project. Um, dense graph project properties. We can tell for um, dense graphs it's completely characterized what properties you can test in constant time. Okay. And a, I'm going to, and this is based on ideas such as the Semaretti regularity lemma, which is um, a, a beautiful result in combinatorics. For hyperfinite graphs, it's also completely characterized. 
Uh, this includes planar graphs and other um, important classes of graphs that are more sparse. For general sparse graphs, um, then there's been a lot of research, but it's more problem by problem. We don't have a, a general characterization, and this is um, an area that's currently being worked on. Uh, there's a lot of work on triangle free, estimating diameter um, that's been done, but there's a lot more to do. Okay, properties of functions. Lots of functions have been considered, linearity, testing whether a function is convex or submodular, low complexity, trigonometric, um, low degree total polynomial, monotone, um, lots of types of functions. And I, my main point here is just to say that uh, the tools that are used come from all over. Some of them are Fourier analytic, others Samaretti regularity lemma I already mentioned. Other tools come from additive number theory. Others come from probability, random walks. Others are more algorithmic in nature, such as local search, simulating greedy algorithms, simulating parallel algorithms. So the tools really come from all over and involve merging all the areas um, of math, statistics, computer science. Okay, so I wanna move to one more model. And here I wanna say a little bit more about it. Um, and that's the case where there are no samples or not many samples. Okay, so here, you have distributions on big domains. You're given samples of a distribution and you want to know things such as what's the entropy? What's the number of distinct elements? What's the shape? Uh, is it close to uniform Gaussian, Zipfian? Uh, and the question is, do you need assumptions on the shape of the distribution a priori, um, such as, is it smooth? Is it monotone? Is it normal? Or can you deal without these assumptions? And what we'd like to do is to, to try to use, to either minimize the assumptions or make no assumptions at all on the shape of the distribution. So these are large, I should mention discrete domains. Um, and a priori, we'd like to make no assumptions at all on whether these are smooth distributions um, or anything such. And the question, and these are sort of basic questions that have been considered in many fields, in statistics and in information theory machine learning, databases needs these, algorithms, physics, biology. Uh, so it's all over the place. Um, and uh, they're sort of basic, very fundamental questions. All right, the key question that we ask is how many samples do you need in terms of the domain size of the distribution? And the question that is of interest is, do you actually need to learn the distribution? Do you need to estimate the probabilities of each domain item? Because if you do, then we know that learning a distribution needs um, the domain size over epsilon squared many samples. Okay, so on one hand, if you need to estimate the probabilities of each domain item in order to figure out whether the distribution has the property you're looking for, then we know we need at least linear in the domain many samples. So that's a lot of samples. Or is it possible that the sample complexity for your testing problem can be sublinear in the size of the domain? Okay, and for the problems that um, th these problems here, all of these cases, the sample complexity for the testing problem can be sublinear in the size of the domain. Okay, so that's, um, that's the exciting part about this area. All right, so um, just to mention in our usual model, we have some, uh, probability, some probability distribution P. Uh, we have a black box that generates samples. We get charged per sample. Um, it's an arbitrary distribution. Its domain is again is discrete. We're gonna use N to denote the domain size. Um, it could be the numbers one through N. It could be some other domain, which we'll discuss in a minute. But every time I push a button, get a new sample, it's gonna be an IID sample from P. Uh, the probability that P assigns to output I, P sub I, is something we don't know. We don't have a clue. And we also don't know that P sub I and P sub J have any a priori relationship to them. And what we're interested in is our sample complexity in terms of the domain size N. Okay, so properties that have been considered are things such as is P the uniform distribution? Uh, given samples of P and samples of Q, are P and Q close or far? Uh, are given samples of um, P as a joint distribution? 
is it independent? Uh, if P is a set of bits and I keep getting a bunch of copies of these bits, are those bits, do they have limited independence? Are they pairwise or k-wise independent? If I think about P, and this is something I'll talk about in a minute, um, a little bit more, if P is a distribution over an ordered domain, uh, let's say um, if I is less than J in the domain, uh, is it the case that probability of I is always less than or equal to the probability of J? Okay, so is there some monotonicity going on in this distribution or some other shape structure? Is P a junta distribution or a Bayesian network? Um, is it compared to, how, does it look like an icing model? Um, is it a determinantal point in process? Uh, is it a, if I have lots of distributions, can I study some joint properties of these distributions? Maybe they're all similar, maybe they're all far. Do they all have similar means? So lots and lots and lots of questions have been considered in this model. Okay, so um, I wanna talk about a specific property of monotonicity, um, testing monotonicity of distributions over the Boolean hypercube domain. Uh, and a, the Boolean hypercube domain um, is, we're gonna think of each element of the domain as being a small d bit string. So we have this d bit string, zero, one to the d. The size of our main domain is two to the d. And in the hypercube domain, we have a partial ordering. We say that domain element X is less than domain element Y, if and only if at each bit, X sub i is less than or equal to Y sub i, okay? And we usually draw this picture where we have a edge um, between nodes that differ in exactly one bit. So 0, 0, 0 has an edge to 1, 0, 0, an, another edge to 0, 1, 0, and another edge to 0, 0, 1. Um, OK. And notice that every node in the partial order is smaller than any other node it can reach by these directed edges in the partial order. So this is the Boolean hypercube. We usually put the um, all zero string in the bottom, the all one string in the top, and we separate the nodes by levels. So level I will have nodes with I ones and D minus I zeros. Okay, so that's kind of the picture of the Boolean hypercube domain. And now if we assign a probability distribution to the nodes in this domain, we'll say that this probability distribution is monotone if whenever the domain element X is less than domain element Y, then the probability we assign to X is also less than or equal to the probability we assign to y. Okay, so that's our definition of a monotone distribution over a partial order, it's what you would expect. So if x and y are not related, like 0, 0, 1 and 1, 0, 0 have no relationship in this partial order, uh, then I can say nothing about p of x versus p of y. Okay, but if, you know, if I can reach one from the other, then I have to be increasing as I go up. All right. So in general, you could have level D, you could have D levels. Um, okay, so how are we going to test whether a distribution is monotone? What we'd like to do is somehow use learning. Okay, so we'd like to learn P hat. The only problem is, as I mentioned before, learning distributions takes the size, at least the size of the domain. So what we'd like to do is learn the distribution assuming that P is monotone, but we don't know P is monotone. That's exactly what we're trying to test, okay? So still, <laughs> we're gonna learn P hat, assuming that P is monotone, even if we don't know that yet. And then what we're gonna do is check that P hat is close to monotone. The thing we learned should be close to monotone if P really was monotone. And also if P hat should be close to P. Now. Why would this, why could we even hope this works? If P really is monotone, then when we learn P hat, assuming P is monotone, then P hat should be close to P, okay? And since P is monotone, P hat should be close to monotone. So if P really was monotone, everything should pass. And if P is far from monotone, then either P hat is also far from monotone or if P hat is close to monotone and P is far from monotone, then P hat has to be far from P, okay? So that's why we would hope that such a testing, um, such a paradigm would work for our testing. And um, the only question is, 
can we learn p hat in sublinear samples? Okay, that's not the only question, but it's the first question. Can we learn hat, p hat in sublinear samples? Because we just said that if I don't assume that p is monotone, we need linear samples. Okay, so somehow using that p is monotone, somehow that should help us. Let's hope that that might help us learn p hat with sublinear samples. Now, we're not gonna get anything drastically better. Remember our domain size is two to the D for the hypercube. The dimension is D. So we have two to the D elements in our domain. Um, there's a lower bound of two to the 0 0.15 D samples that's implied by something called Telegrand-like distributions. These are a family of um, functions that come that are highly studied in combinatorics and in complexity theory uh, and so we, one can show a lower bound for learning um, that's exponential in the dimension, but it still leaves open the possibility that we could have a sublinear learning algorithm. Okay, so that's um, in fact what we get. There's a sublinear learning algorithm. It's sublinear in the domain size. It's still exponential in the dimension, but you know the, the domain size is exponential in dimension and this is less exponential in the dimension. Okay, so, uh, I'm going to say a little bit more about this algorithm in a minute, because uh, I think I have a minute. Um, but what, what this gives us, once we say how we get, got that algorithm, is we now can learn p hat um, in sublinear samples. We can check that p hat is close to monotone. Here, we're going to have a complete description of p hat. No further samples will be needed. We can use some sort of linear program or some brute force search. The only thing I should mention at this point is the uh, learning algorithm, though it's sublinear samples, it's actually superlinear time. Um, so the search for a sublinear time and sublinear sample algorithm for testing and learning monotonicity is still open. Uh, so something good to work on. Okay, now, um, so no further samples are needed to check that p hat is cl close to monotone. That's purely a computational problem. Um, to check that p hat is close to p is the big bottleneck because there we need some tolerance. We know that p hat is not exactly p and it turns out that this is something we can do in sublinear time, just barely and over log n samples. And it's similar to an analysis of valiant and valiant. So this is the bottleneck. Um, and if one can improve this, then one can improve the whole paradigm. All right, so this gives an order n over log n sample uh, monotonicity testing algorithm. And in, I think, when, um, in the couple of minutes I have remaining, I'm just going to say a word about this monotone algorithm. Um, to talk about this algorithm, I have to define something called tight and slacky elements. So remember that if f is monotone, then the function value at x has to be at least as big as, the, as all of its predecessors. Okay, so it's max over all predecessors y, f of y. Now, we're going to say x is tight if, if we have equality in this, um, in this relationship. But so f of x is just what it needs to be to be bigger than its predecessors. But otherwise, we're going to say x is slacky, meaning f of x is not only bigger than all of its predecessors, but it's even a little bit bigger. Okay, so there is some slack involved in x, in f of x. So here's an example. Um, if you take the distribution p that's uniform in the upper half, and zero on the bottom half. This is a monotone distribution. Um, but if you take a domain element that's right in the middle, it's the bottom part of the upper half, the bottom level of the upper half, um, then we see that a, its value is two over two to the n, but all of its predecessors have value zero. So this is a slacky element, okay? Uh, if we take something from either the bottom half in the middle or the top half, but not the, bottom row of the top half, then uh, it's going to be exactly equal to the values of its predecessors. And these guys we call tight, okay? So motivation to this learning algorithm is actually a lemma from a computational complexity result uh, by Blaze et al. And I'm gonna restate it, but consider any monotone function, this is a Boolean function, um, then, you can take this function, uh, which has tight and slacky elements all over, and you can rewrite it um, or approximate it by a function that has 
slacky elements only at a constant number of special levels, okay? And part of the work is to extend this um, to be useful for probability distributions. I'm not gonna mention how, but why is this actually interesting? Um, well, if you have very few slacky levels, so very few, then most elements not only are tight, but they're far from slacky levels, okay? So X is tight, most elements are tight, and they're actually pretty far from slacky levels. So what you can notice though, is if I wanna figure out what is the value of X, I can look at its largest predecessor at its next, at the next slacky level below it. Okay, so I can check all the different Y's on this level and notice that um, why, the, if I look at the largest predecessor, then P of X and P of Y have to be identical because X is tight and everything in here is tight. And this is the first place that's slacky. So all of these guys have to have the same value. Okay, which means that the probability distribution is constant in this diamond. And since these X is kind of far from slacky, I mean, this is not gonna work. Um, so I should say this is, this is true for all X in between the slacky levels. But what's interesting about X that's a little bit far from the slacky level is that if I take enough samples, I'm likely to land in here and I can estimate the probability, the total probability of this diamond and then divide by the number of points in this diamond. Okay, so I, once I take enough samples, I'm likely to fall in this diamond and have a pretty good estimate of the average probability in this diamond. So I can figure out what's P of X, okay? And I can do this, um, so there's a, you know, this is true for the largest predecessor that it, everything is constant. It's not true for the other predecessors, but if we just take the maximum average probability, that's a good estimate of P of X. And that's how we're gonna learn. We're gonna go through every single X. We're gonna go um, compare it to a, for every single X, um, and we're gonna do this diamond type thing and figure out the maximum value to its next slacky level. Um, and that's the probability we're gonna do for X. So we're gonna try Y, Y prime, Z, Z prime, all of the different values here. It's all the ones that precede X, look at the diamonds, the one that gets the largest average, that's the one we're gonna assign as P of X, okay? Now, this is gonna work really well for those X's that are far enough away from the slacky level that I have enough samples in here to estimate it. It's not gonna work so great for the X's here, but notice that you know, there's not that many slacky levels that I'm gonna mess up. There's not that many levels, there's not many points right above the slacky levels. Most points are kind of far from a slacky level because we have so few slacky levels. So this actually gives a really good algorithm and that's the basis. Okay, so that's all I have to say about that because I'm running out of time, it's good. I just wanna mention there's a lot of directions that um, we're considering in the FODC um, proposal. So things such as mergeable summaries for statistics, numerical linear algebra, random projections for complex clustering problems, sublinear sampling bounds for structured high dimensional distribution, and lots of other um, directions. Okay, so in conclusion, I want to say sublinear problems are everywhere. Uh, for many of these problems, we need a lot fewer resources than you might think. And there's really a lot of cool ideas and techniques, and there's very strong connections between math, CS, and statistics in the techniques. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, if we have any quick questions, you can pop them in the Q&A. And, &A, and um, while folks are thinking about that, uh, maybe Martin could set up his screen sharing. Should I stop here? Yeah, that would be great. Thanks, Ronnie. All right, so um, looks like no, no, no questions. It's time to move to Martin's talk. So, um, thanks, thanks again, Ronnie. So um, uh, the last.